All right. Hello, everybody. I think we are now live. Let's uh, see who's in the chat here before uh, I introduce our guest for today. I see I see Fresher Luke. I'm not surprised to see him the being the first guy in the chat here, uh, an appreciator of skeletons oh, in cool. comics. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Uh, we got Kobo Doc. He's one of one of my dudes from the Discord. Nimbus, also nice. another amazing artist. Oh wait, one second. I'm hearing my own echo. How embarrassing. There we go. All right, cool. Got Fright Night. She's uh, also a big fan of doing stuff that uh, is kind of like a permanent Halloween themed comics. Got Diverse Kitty, who I don't know, but hello, Diverse Kitty. How are you doing today? Anyways, folks, we are going to be talking with Benjamin Shipper today. Um, he is the creator of this graphic novel, Joe Death and the Graven Image. If any of you have been tuning into my Twitch live streams, which I'm sure every single one of you have, and if you haven't, you should be, um, you've no doubt heard me talk about this. There, this is one of the best graphic novels I have read in my entire life. Um, best way I could describe it is it's like gothic Americana frontier fantasy. Uh, it's very return to Oz sort of dust bowl um, mythology, melancholy kind of stuff. Or I like to describe it as Cormac McCarthy's Cuphead. <laughs> Anyways, so... <laughs> That's my little pitch for it. I've got the I've got the link to it on Amazon in the show notes here in the info section. So be sure to check it out during or after the talk. So, anyways, with that intro out of the way, let's go ahead and give the mic to Ben. Ben, how are you doing today? And tell us about you and your book. Yeah, thanks, Reagan. I appreciate the promotion on your Twitch and just in general. Uh, that's a that's high praise. Um, uh, I don't know if I uh, came prepared for the vibe because my shirt is all Hawaiian and I'm. I'm, yeah, I'm counter we're nicely, we're nice and reversed. I'm the, I'm the Californian here and I'm not wearing anything tropical or beachy at all. Yes. We need, we need each other to balance it. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, Joe death and the graven image, um, came out in April. Um, and, uh, so, yeah. first graphic novel. Um, I really appreciate the, the, definitely the high praise of like best graphic novel you've ever read. Um, though, like, sure some of it's hyperbole i'm sure i don't want to assume that it's like i'm a newcomer and so i'm doing things differently in a in a kind of an amateur way but i think that's a very that's a very agreeable situation uh to come into a new field what i mean by that is tolkien and lewis were amateur writers they did not make their living as authors they were scholars and you know they taught, they're just, they're teachers um, at, a, at a, uh, of course, an amazing school like Oxford, but um, they came into the field as amateurs. And so they did things wrong, uh, you know, essentially like as authors, you know, if you were looking to pitch a book to um, the current authors of the time, um, like you probably wouldn't start I mean, Tolkien tried initially for the Silmarillion, like every book he, he published, he, I feel like he tried like, oh, hey, now, now it's my Silmarillion. Anyway, all that to say is like, um, yeah, like I think because uh, I'm a little bit of an amateur and a, and a new new author, uh, it's, a, it's a bit of that, like um, it, I'm, you're able to sort of uh, more shock and awe if you don't know what's, <laughs> what exactly are the... Um, the rules and the tropes in comics and i really don't like i'm, I'm learning a lot uh and i and i think that's a, a really appropriate thing to do is to learn the the craft that you're um you're uh you're you're making your work in but um but yeah i didn't know i, I had to learn a lot on the fly and i'm glad you've included some of the the previous like um the previous versions uh, on here in the slideshow because there were said this multiple times elsewhere, but there were just about five versions of issue one, which is chapter one in the book. And, um, you know, six, the next issues were had like maybe four for chapter two, maybe three revisions for chapter three, and definitely two revisions for chapter six, like the whole book had a, had a revision um, page. Uh, so the, the time in which I got to, to draft it 
um, to basically have my have the story all the way through and then realize I don't really like this story, um, which happened which happened because of COVID. Like I wouldn't have had the time to do that unless Dark Horse was like, hey, the pandemic just happened and uh, we're not publishing anything. So just pause. Um, and so that's when I got to have the time to to what what I think you know make it a, a, a much better book. I could say a great book, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I can um, call it a great book, but it's certainly like um, one that's close to my heart as far as like it's got everything in it that I like, which is from a literature standpoint, the the prose or the the dialogue is very um, pretty lofty and archaic. Um, almost heroic, I would say. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's something I noticed about it. I know we've both talked a lot about Gene Wolfe uh, in some of our previous conversations, but that was one of the things that came to mind was that reading this, I don't know if there, if I have any slides that kind of show some examples of that dialogue, but when I, when I was reading through this, I was honestly, I liked how dense it was and how it lended itself to a second reading pass in order to fully appreciate the texture of what was being said. Like for me, like when I write dialogue, it's very terse. It's very just direct kind of, I, I, I make no bones about it. I do very wooden George Lucas, James Cameron, Mike Mignola type dialogue because I, I don't have a very, <laughs> I just, I overthink it too much. So I have to keep it simple. But when I was reading this, I felt truly transported to like, like this story have come out of another time. Like I could almost picture this if it hadn't been, you know, done with digital coloring and all that. Like I could have pictured it. I could have believed that this was an artifact from you know, the 1930s or something like the, or the Windsor McKay era, where when you read comics back then they have, a, I would, I would definitely say like, there's a, a more archaic English, uh, American English specifically to them. What were some of your influences or I don't know where, what it, where, where do you get that from? Yeah. Um, I, I hope no one's ever, I mean, if you see me elsewhere, like I usually talk about C.S. Lewis or Tolkien, uh, and like, a lot of my I, a lot of my audience are big Lewis yeah. and Tolkien appreciators, so you're you're in good company here. Yeah, and I mean that's that's I think it's single you know single handedly <laughs> they both you know uh, had contributed to this kind of like style for myself and the, the ability to not not imitate it perfectly but imitate it in some regard um, was just you know the Hobbit, the Lord of the Rings. The Chronicles of Narnia, like reading those books, also listening to the audiobooks, um, you just gain that memory of um, how how and how do I write? How does how does one write? <laughs> um, and mm -hmm. I really like I'm not great at, at grammar. Like I just remember being in you know early primary school, sweating you know as as uh, as teachers were like, okay, you know, uh, take apart this sentence, you know, where's the noun, where's the verb, where's the, you know, are these co double con, you know, two consonants or, uh, like all that stuff. It just petrified me. Cause I didn't, I don't know. I don't know why I didn't, it doesn't click with me. Um, but I'm really not, I'm, I'm trying to learn more about, uh, just how English or how our language works. But, um, mm -hmm. but really I think, you know, imit it's an imitation game and that, that vibe, that language or style of writing, it's similar to a style of drawing. Like you just pay attention to a few people um, who are doing what you really like, do, you know, would like to do, and you're going to start copying them. And then you're going to, you know, the addition of other people that you copy equals something, um, something that looks like genuinely you, but genuinely you is, you know, it's, you are generally genuinely a mixture of your mother and your father, you know, like <laughs> there's the origin the cult of originality is, um, you know, I think was worn thin, but unfortunately like for younger people, it's always like a, it's a lie that people really uh, buy into or um, I don't know, you know, 
uh, it's it's it sounds it sounds good or it sounds it sounds true because we're as young people we're not exposed to everything so as we grow and we're exposed to more people and more artists we realize oh this this one is looking at this one is looking at this one so yeah nice yeah i i i still would say that uh there there is originality in this and that you're taking things that may even be common but combining them in an uncommon way i think that you know that's going to be the essence of like true totally. or at least what the, the closest thing we can come to to originality or true creativity and yeah even that alone even that alone is a rare skill i mean you we look at just how most of mainstream entertainment is kind of a you know a reboot of a reboot or a sequel of a sequel just endlessly you know because there's you know, you know because people calculate that it's it's not very risky and if you just do it enough the audiences will just accept it as normal and turn up for it what yeah. i really what i did like about what you're doing is how outside it feels and what i mean by outside is it's there, there really is not anything that it, it breaks a lot of things that, you know, some people might consider rules as far as, you know, low, the amount of text or uh, some of the shape choices you make in it where like I look at them and I just think like if I tried to draw that, it would be so utterly incoherent. But yet you manage to make these little abstract things that would be blobs into coherent uh, character shapes. Hmm. um how what has the reception been like uh so far for uh joe death yeah um that's a good question um i i totally agree i totally agree with your combination like uh creation you know creation is combination like and and yeah i mean i totally agree with the originality of of a new combination of things that like you know someone based on your individual love of something and of two things, two or three things, you put them together. No one would have ever done that, but you do it. And it's like, Whoa, why has no one done this before? And it's because the, you know, that take that one person takes that one person or uh, to, to do that, that kind of combination. Um, yeah, I totally agree. Um, what was the reception to Joe death or what has been the reception to Joe death? Yeah. Like how, yeah. Just what's the overall response been from what you can yeah. tell. Yeah. Um, positive, positive. So the first print run was 3000 copies. Um, I want to say, I want to say, and I could look back at my emails, but in the first, so it was out in the book market for a month and then it goes, Oh, sorry. It, out in the comic market, comic shops have access to um, ordering it from Diamond. They had that for about a month. And then the next month is the book market. So Amazon, any any lower bookstore, any smaller bookstore um, has access to it then. And uh, I wanna say like at the end of the month in both of those, so two months basically being out there, it sold like 2,300 copies. I'm like rounding up or down is like 2,300 copies. Um, and I bought, I bought 300 of those copies. So that's included too, to sell at shows. So it, it seemed like a, it seemed like sales wise or numbers wise, like kind of a home run, like two months, you know, two months. It's still, I don't know if it's all sold out. Um, I still need to ask our course. Um, but sales wise, like, it seems like a home run. People have been really, uh, friendly online about saying like beautiful book loved it Lo you know love i i love hearing the things that i think people would have trouble with which might be the language or the obtuseness of some of the um story because of the lack of exposition it's all in dialogue um but like that has been like really good um positive um positive feedback like um there there are definitely some that are like could not read this like 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 the art or arts passable or something but didn't know what was happening you know uh and i i think that's you know i think that's valid like it's there's not it is it is it's not you can't please everybody you can't please everyone <laughs> yeah 
uh, and I could grow better at, at some things being, being clear. Um, so yeah, yeah. Like, uh, every, every time I'm at shows, like I, I sell enough to make, uh, make the show costs and like travel costs and stuff. So, um, yeah, there are some, there are some hard, harder shows. Like there was one in Nashville, uh, fan expo. And it was just like every copy, uh, that I sold there was like, it was work, uh, to get people to come over and sort of interact with the book. And once they did that, they, you, they, there was usually, usually like a 60%, 60 to 70% buying, uh, rate. Uh, yeah. So, um, but I'm sorry if I'm missing any comments that I should be. Um, oh no, actually, well, there was one question from a uh, fresher Luke who said, have you ever resisted the urge to throw some street slang in there? I think he's, he's referring to when we were talking about the, the, the kind of archaic Amera English that, uh, you had the characters speak in. Yeah. Have I ever resisted? Actually. Um, yes. So a lot of the for a lot of the complete early draft had some of that, like had some of that more modern kind of slang. Uh, and then I saw star Wars, uh, was the, was the new Disney star Wars, the first one, uh, the force awakens. And mm -hmm. like, I, see, I saw that happen there in, in their, uh, movie. And I was like, Oh, I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't sound right. It like, yeah, there's, there's comedy and it's funny when it happens. It, the weird thing is that it works when it happens in that movie. Like when, let's say, um, Poe is flying the, the cruiser. Um, I don't even know which movie this is in, but mm -hmm. he's joking with like the Hux guy and it's funny. It truly is funny, but it throws me out of the world of star Wars. I um, agreed exactly like that's yeah. that was exactly my problem with it. Yeah, and like when Finn does it in a uh, with Ray on the ship, like you know, with the boyfriend comment, it's like it, it's funny. It's generally funny, but it's it's at the expense of the world that was already there. Like, and I think I mean that was a different choice because this is my world I'm just making. So, but that 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 um director editor kind of perspective is like does this is this a comedy book that i'm writing or is it is it a is it a mythological um higher fantasy epic fantasy kind of genre with humor in it um yeah so that's a it was a good um yeah i did struggle with that and uh yeah even, even now there are some um like modern like um modern profanity in the in, a, in the last bit there's a small section there and um it's like yeah i don't that i think it's appropriate and i think it's the right place in the right moment and i don't know that i could have fat if i fabricated some fancy word for <laughs> the, the f word or something like it just doesn't work yeah yeah uh, i i was actually gonna ask about that at some point but i figure we can go into it now like you know i i like I, most of my, I'd say like a lot of my followers, you know, they like stuff that is accessible for an all ages audience and stuff. And I think, you know, a big problem in, uh, not just, not just movies, but also it's definitely in comics, especially like, uh, just, there, there is a huge epidemic of, uh, receding hairline millennials, which, you know, I'm certainly one of them. Well, actually, no, I, I went bald when I was 21. So I'm like, I, I'm, I don't even have a hairline to recede anymore. Um, but there is a problem. Th no, yeah, there's a problem. <laughs> yeah, there's a problem with the uh, Norwooding millennials that, uh, you know, where they they throw cussing or profanity or, you know, just v vulgarity into their fictional dialogue, thinking that it's inherently going to make it cooler or funnier or more textured or something when it just, it really comes off as like, Oh, you, you kind of seem like an eighth grader who just learned a dirty word for the first time in with where in the one cuss word you used in this book, it, it, tr it did feel like this was like the one, the one spot to put it like without spoiling anything for everybody. It's, it's in a scene where it's like truly like a, a one of the like, 
most visceral depictions of like despair and loss and hopelessness that I've seen in a, in a comic. I, I can only compare it maybe to something from like, you know, that hideous strength or screw tape letters, um, where it's just like, it's a character who's just feeling so utterly lost and abandoned by God and themselves and everything. And it makes sense there. It's like a very, it, it punctuates it nicely. So I, I thought that that was very responsibly done. And I say that as somebody who, you know, I did six years in the Marines and I had to, I had to cuss in order to breathe and I've been yeah. slowly unlearning it over time. And I, I can appreciate people who can convey that sort of, uh, verbal intensity without resorting to casual vulgarity. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Thanks. Glad, yeah, yeah. Kobo Doc in the chat agrees. <laughs> Thank you, Kobo Doc. Yeah. Yeah, for some of I for some of the uh inspirations for this, like it, without knowing much else about you, if I had to make any guesses, I mean obviously Mike Magnola would certainly be up there i'm and i say that because i'm super inspired by him and i can usually smell when somebody else's too but narratively and thematically did you get any influence from like uh l frank Baum, the guy who made the oz books or anything any other like authors or artists storytellers in particular yeah um think about that definitely not l frank Baum. like i've never read uh what is it called? Alice in Wonderland? No, it's not Alice in Wonderland. Uh, the Oz, you know, Wizard of Oz, Oz, Oz Return yeah, to Oz, Oz series. I don't know that I've seen the full movie. Um, I definitely oh, have wow. Return to Oz. I would love to see it Return to Oz because you, you've mentioned it twice. Um, and uh, thank you, Meerkat280. Um, I'd love to I'd love to see it. But th yeah, those were not. Um, and I wonder, I wonder if it's the mix of like American and fairy tale. Like I'm an American and I'm looking at European fairy tales. Um, not as often as I think maybe I, I should, but um, but that type of searching for a metaphor type of thing, like the lion uh, is a metaphor, the tin man is a metaphor, the scarecrow is a metaphor, um, really clear metaphors. Um, they're manifested as physical people, like the lion that has trouble with courage. The Tin Man that is, what is his trouble? He doesn't have a heart, right? Um, the uh, Scarecrow that's, yeah. What's he straw? Uh, anyway, <laughs> they all have problems. Uh, and they're, they're, they can be identified by their shape and by their form. And so um, I definitely, I don't, yeah, it must have been that I'm just looking at, at the same, looking or thinking in the same way of trying to think about the, the spiritual aspect, which is the things that aren't seen, uh, and trying to give them a skin that is physical. Um, so, but, uh, so storytellers like, uh, like, um, Ray Bradbury, uh, mm. the, he is one inspiration, like of story wise that I, uh, I just loved, love his books. Like he was sort of the first writer that, um, I really like, I was just like blown away by uh, him as a write writer, like a style, the style that he wrote in, um, especially Fahrenheit 451. It's just like bang, 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 boom, like clipped, clipped sentences, clipped phrases didn't do. I mean, I think there's probably like chains of dialogue, but he doesn't even bother to say Montag said, Beatty said, you know, Clarissa said he just, he just goes down and just one after the other, the reader is smart enough to say like, Oh, I know who's talking. I know who's talking. I know who's talking. And, um, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I really, really like him. Um, talking but, about the, uh, kind of like the American folklore vibe of it. I like that. I, I talked about this with, uh, so, somebody else on a, a different stream recently where we briefly got on the topic of Ralph Bakshi's wizards, how, there's yeah. certain there's certain ways of depicting elves there's like the european 
you know, El idea of elf, you know, the Tolkien elf, the the Norns, stuff like that. And then there's the kind of the filtered through the American, especially like the Midwestern lens, where it's almost this sort of you know grandma's kitschy little ceramic statuettes kind of style where they're a little bit kind of like more gnome ish or like Santa's elves ish. And I like that. I get a little bit of that feeling in, in some of the artwork in Joe death, you know, where like the, some of the characters will have like, you know, these funny little uh, pointy hats and stuff, which just sort of symbolically tells, tells us like, Oh, you know, this is, this is fantasy land. This is fairy land or whatever, but it's a, it's like a, I don't know. It takes me back to like old Disney stuff where they just very quickly and symbolically clue the viewer into, Hey, this is taking place in either medieval times or fantasy or folklore. They would use very, very simplified little symbols like that. And I don't, I don't know if you were consciously doing that in yeah. Joe death, but that's definitely what it came across as is like this very, you know, cornfield uh americana idea of elves and the the wee folk and stuff like that yeah yeah um yep cartoon cartoon like cartoon as its own language i think like um like and i mean uh like cartoon like i guess it's there's a specific definition or something like i mean the the word originated as like a cartoon was a i think a pattern that like michelangelo you know cut into a cut into paper that he would kind of uh, paste up and get his uh get his design or get his uh like underdrawing onto a stucco or a fresco i think that's what or the ceiling so he would get he would make a cartoon of the painting that he would paint and i think that's what the the, the meaning of it or the the word where it came from um but it's certainly something that like i think could could stand like a, a tighter definition or a, a more a definition now um or at least a personal one so i'll try but like cartoons i think like are I, I i'm usually thinking of animation um and less about comics but they began like that kind of big foot big foot big nose kind of animation um or, or cartooning like did start in comics um but it's like yeah it's so like juvenile like i think like it's so um it's so desirable because it's like juvenile, juvenile, uh, kind of like if you look at Hello Kitty or, um, like, uh, any kind of Japanese, <laughs> you know, um, they don't call it kitschy. It's like, what is that word that they use for, for cute? Can't remember. I think ka kawaii, I think. Yeah. 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 Um, kawaii and, uh, but, uh, Fantasia, Mickey, um, like, I mean, I guess all the, you know, aggregating all of the, cartoons that have been made or Tetsuka's uh, Astro Boy, like um, there's real definable notes of like what, a, what a cartoon is. And, and the interesting thing is that what they could do. So because it's a mass mass media kind of uh, style um, or it's, it's usually employed in mass media uh, movies, TV shows, comic books on a large scale it can't do certain things um like uh you know certainly profanity and and uh sexuality stuff is like it's getting less and less and now you know postmodern like people are doing that a lot where it's like oh it's you know it's uh your favorite looney tunes uh you know um in in the in the worst ways possible or like uh yeah her, you know it's 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 taking that and like basically saying here's your childhood. Now here's what an adult life is. And it's usually pretty profane and graphic sexually and, and, uh, going that way. 
because that's to them that's what adult is or that's what maturity is um but uh there's there's no concept of aging beautifully or or nobly yeah yeah and so that you get a shock and awe kind of with that type of juxtaposition of of a cartoon doing the things that you're you know you would only see on a hbo movie or something (laughs) um but yeah I, i think there's much more to be done uh in a in a mature way um with with the with the wonderful language of cartoons um and uh, i I totally agree with that i I, one common problem i i encounter is you know running into people who you know they, they might have maybe more i don't know traditional or conservative sensibilities and they'll dismiss cartoons and comics and animation as like oh that's just that's for kids or something like that. Mm-hmm. And, and then they'll wonder like, okay, what, wait a second. Why are my kids consuming such awful trash media out there? Or, you know, what, why are they spending, you know, 12 hours a day on, you know, watching TikTok, yeah, sis, sissy hypno videos and stuff. Yeah. It's like, well, that's because you dismissed, you know, the entertainment arts as frivolous and non-essential. Right. And so this is, I would describe your your book, Joe Death, as uh, a comic for people who don't normally like comic books. It's I think for you know people who are maybe like more like they're more of like the novel crowd only. I think they'll appreciate the density of the prose that you put in there, which is very very rare uh, for a comic book. Um, and then the people who you know, just have any kind of appreciation for a, a good s- story are, I think they'll be able to see if they, if they can get past their initial knee jerk dismissal of the, you know, the comic medium format and just open it up and get 10 pages in, I think they'll be hooked. And this is, a, I, I like that. It, that makes it a lot more accessible. You know, it's not this like, 20 year going hero uh, cape saga or something where you know the you have no idea where to start like i like that this is a a self-contained story with the beginning and end possible room for a sequel i hope yeah yeah yep. did you have any of that in mind when you were creating this like wanting wanting to use comics in a way that is accessible for people who uh normally don't uh read comics yeah yes absolutely because like i uh i mean i really don't i i um i do not uh yeah i don't want to anger any like hardcore comics only readers um but but i'm not one and so there are a lot of things and and if you read if you read more literature uh you're like I was always trying to find the, the best comic book graphic novel and like there, there are great ones. I mean, there are great, there are great comics, great graphic novels, and they're great for different reasons. Never have I been like, I'll take this graphic novel over most of like classic literature. It's like classic literature, like to me always like is just the best stories. Um, maybe because I have a visual imagination and I can see, I can do a lot of the the visualization in my brain for, for each of the stories and to you just get more depth with the character, I feel like, but anyway, um, but I love, I love uh, the visual medium. I love visuals, images. They're so powerful. They're so, you know, just, they're so fun to, to make, to draw. Um, so I did have that intention of like making a graphic novel that, that would um that could stand up to uh someone who's uh a classical books only type of person or something mm-hmm. like it could it could stand up in a you know a, a hoity-toity kind of uh you know literature class in a in a prestigious college like that there would be enough there to to discuss and disagree with and comment on and um and talk about uh intellectually um that yeah so you know and and for that reason i don't think that it just 
sales in the in the comics world like it just doesn't you know it's not flying off the shelf i mean it, it i think it's sold well but it's a it's a little bit of a gamble because mm. the, the baked in audience or the audience that's there is you, you know for comics is usually comics primary readers um and i am trying to kind of like by by example or by by the craft itself convince um convince like you know the intellectual crowd that uh in my particular way other cartoonists do that actually well in their their different ways um that there's something here uh that's worthwhile and that there's potential here that can uh be ex you know be found or made I got a question from modern businessman he asked uh do you start with colors or shading for i'm assuming yeah. he means like once you've done line art or whatever mm -hmm. yeah um shading shading uh i mean if you look at my pictures most of them right now are just all flat so flat like the color there's really no variation in um in the in the blacks so there's black line and then there's like ink which it's just a uh, digital ink all the black is um just like another color in photoshop but um i do start with just but probably values it, maybe for shading is what you mean or what you're getting at i do start with like gray you know black and white and gray uh to figure out my values and the shading really uh to to figure out that mood well, where's where's the light coming from um who's you know who's in shadow who's not in shadow uh i do figure that out first and then i'll figure out what color the scene should be Nice. Yeah, it's about the same same way I approach it. I just I go heavy on the inks first, and then whatever whatever needs to be filled in after that. I, that's where yeah. I go in with my midtones and colors. Um, I also w wanted to ask, like the, I guess you could say like the I don't know if the term is like the the mythos or the the in worlds like pantheon or what have you. People who maybe come from a, a Christian or culturally Christian background will probably pick up on, you know, some similarities there. But I liked that it was written in such a way where it's not just ham fisted uh, allegory, which, you know, I can't stand like that's a that's a problem I have with stuff that is, you know, often branded as like Christian media. It it's just really like screaming in your face. It's not about the art or the beauty of the thing. It's just about the message and very little care for respecting the audience. I think hmm. um, yeah. when you were, when you were writing this and, and feel free to talk about, you know, any of your faith background, if, if you feel inclined to, how did you, were you digging from your own uh, personal experience in life or were you kind of distilling a lot of things from, again, from like Lewis and Tolkien, how they, how their, their faith informed their fantasy worlds? Um, yeah, I, think, I mean, uh, I mean, I think I would if I could. Like, like, it's really you can only kind of archaeologically uh, dig uh, from what's known from people. So, like, the work that Tolkien Lewis made. Uh, and then like, let's say the events of their lives, you know, from a biographer and stuff and what they said to someone else that recorded that, like, there's really, there's really not a ton of like, um, I think experience. I mean, for the personal experience of, and what I mean by that is like, what's going on in your mind, uh, you know, during your forties and during your fifties, you're during your thirties you know, and twenties. Uh, it's like, it's, it's hard for me to get that. I do often think about that with those authors and other people, you know, like thinking about what, what, where they were in their job, where they were in their family, what were the things that they probably, inf that probably influenced them to make these decisions in their writing. Um, but yes, like my, my own, yeah, my own, uh, like, um, my own tradition of truth, the tradition of truth that I'm in, uh, you know, it, it does claim to be like ultimate truth, uh, 
from from the Hebrew Bible, and um, and I mean I have I have to say it because that's what I believe. <laughs> that there's like a universal ultimate truth, um, but unfortunately, I think that's like uh, in an American way, it's it's seen as like fighting words. It's like um, because you know I think everyone else is wrong or something, or because of that I I judge people, you know that's not that's not uh, the the attitude i i ever want to take of course i could take it and do do take it when when i'm at my uh when i'm at my worst but um but that that for a christian the the grappling that we have to do like with what we're saying is true uh is intense if if truly engaged in like it is like nightmare intensity. Mm-hmm. If something traumatic has happened in your life, uh, if you know someone that has you know tra- uh, traumatic experiences in their life, um, the grappling that you you have to engage in uh, on a on a relational level with God, who who says you know he wants to engage with you in that way, um, is like intense, and so. That's that's something that I, I wanted to present in Joe Death. Um, that he he is a character and he uh, has a past um, and a future, and um, you know uh, most people who's read this or uh, watching maybe have read it. If uh, if you haven't, like maybe this I'll I'll spoil some or I'll I'll engage with like actual content in the book. Um, yeah. Yeah. Feel free to be as spoiler as you want. I'll give people a chance to mute if they, if they, if they need to. So that that's your warning folks. <laughs> You've been warned. Um, but you know, Joe's a skeleton. That's when we meet him. But through the course of the story, we realize his past was not always a skeleton. You know, he had a fully fleshed existence. Um, and uh, here's where I talk about uh, Animorphs, <laughs> though I've never read Animorphs. I there's something about those covers of the Animorph books that's like a, it's like a, a human, you know, changing into whatever is a grasshopper or a bat or a lion or something. You know, there's all these iterations of like evolution between these 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 two different characters: a human and a, and a, an animal. And um, though I've never read those books, like that's, um, we do that all the time with anthropomorph anthropomorphication <laughs> mm-hmm. or anthropomorphizing things like trees, pl- flowers. Like this is this is part of the cartoon language, um, and so it just felt you know really natural to create a character that was a, a skeleton that could walk and talk and drink even. Um, and it not be, uh, yeah, it, it's part of that. It's part of that language. So thinking about him with with a body, you know, fully fleshed, like it, uh, he just became he became more of a dog uh, kind of character, um, and both both like four legged dog, uh, and you know, and this is in other traditions like a werewolf or a lichen or something. Um, or, or really like Saint Christopher, like mm-hmm. I didn't know. Uh, I didn't know about Saint Christopher. I'm not Orthodox uh, or Catholic, and so I didn't know about Saint Christopher or dog-headed men. Um, and anyway, he just kind of became this this way uh, for for a personal reason. So I so I had a I had a dog. My wife and I had a dog. She has passed, and I miss her a lot. Um, but there was this point in which. Uh, my dog Willow was lying on my chest <laughs> and we were about, we were going to have our, our son. Uh, our son is three now, but I just knew like, I will not have time. I won't have time. Uh, I promise this is about the story. <laughs> I feel like it's, it's going off, but it's about the story. It's where, where a lot of this, a lot of the themes in Joe death come from. I thought I will not have time for Willow, our dog, like I used to, like I do now because my son is coming and to, to like, I know there's, you know, there's going to be a lot of time in which that, that child is going to take up my time. And I was just like, how do I communicate this to Willow? 
our, our dog, will I be able to communicate this to Willow? Like, n no, I, I will. And I, I'm finite. I'm, you know, I, I won't, just won't be able to have time, the same amount of time for her as I used to. Uh, and, you know, thinking about, thinking about scripture, uh, thinking about paradise lost, um, John Milton's paradise lost and the, the fall of the angels and this type of, um, you know, the fall of the angels really because of the introduction of man, almost like, and I'm not, I'm not a biblical scholar, but the, the mythology or the, the theology or the, the story, I began to formulate, you know, what se seems to be explicitly expressed, which is like almost that humans became the apple of God's eye. They were his true children. They were tr his true image. And, um, in a, in a very human way or, or a, a very story way, it's like that introduction of a new child, you know, that caused Lucifer or Satan to be jealous. Like he is no longer the, uh, bright, you know, shining star, uh, that he thought he was or, or he is, but nothing really has changed with him and, and essentially God's love except for the introduction of something new that is taking time away from potential fellowship or, or attention from him. He feels, he feels robbed from that attention or something. Um, and so he, you know, he, he makes havoc. He, he destroys the thing God is attending to. Um, and I thought about that, like, you know, that relationship of like, you know, if Willow, if Willow was, if Willow, our dog, you know, I want her to be in, in harmony with Abel. I don't want, I don't want Abel to uh, be a problem between, you know, <laughs> uh, that, that relationship. It's like keeping up relationships kind of. So, but anyway, God in, in this story, it's, it's not, it, it can't be one-to-one -one, like scriptural mm -hmm. uh, God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy spirit. Um, but there's certainly relationships in the story uh, of hierarchy between like uh, the the boy and man that 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 loves Joe as a dog and that teaches him how to read, teaches him how to write and to think. And he's preparing he's preparing Joe for active fellowship with him and with humanity when he's away from him. Um, and that, and he's, he's hoping for harmony, but things go wrong. Uh, and in, in other, um, other books, I'd like to, I definitely like to fill this out uh, and bring in more characters and really flush out the nuance of that. So it was a really long answer. <laughs> no, but it was a, it was a great one though. Like I, I like that. Uh, I, I don't know the, to me, like, I think the way you handled it is you're you're treating you know the biblical subject matter or inspiration material as you know what what it's worth as a story a story material like somebody who is not a christian could read this and still you know still just read it and receive it as this is just the this is just the fantasy lore of this world that I'm dipping into. It's not something that is, you know, waving a, a mission, uh, an evangelism track at, at you or something, or trying to trick you into showing up at Bible study ne next week or something like that. It's just, th there was a certain sort of honesty to it that I, I appreciate. And it's something that I've, you know, I, I, I've talked about this in my live streams a bit that I, I think, I think as artists and storytellers, visual storytellers, I think one of the few things we do have a responsibility to do is to treat our stories as if we are giving a gift to the audience and not trying to just, you know, beat them over the head with uh, a, you should, or you shouldn't kind of, uh lesson it's like that that's just that's never going to change anybody's mind but if all you can do is is give people a maybe a bit of escapism from whatever stress 
they're going through or just the tedium of daily life. And, and also something that for you is deeply meaningful. I do think that it, it transcends uh, worldview, religious backgrounds, cultural background, whatever identity classification you want to put on there. I think, I think people can, at least, you know, mature enough readers. And when I say mature, I don't necessarily mean like age wise, but I just mean people who can read with an open mind, uh, will definitely appreciate the ride that this story takes you on. Cause if, if nothing else, it's a hell of a ride. <laughs> and, I, and I say, and I say hell, like literally, like it goes to, the kind of like 1920s 30s rubber hose animation idea of like betty boop hell uh -huh. uh, that i'm thinking of like it's which yeah. I, I i've only seen like cuphead kind of channel that and there's a special sort of like fever nightmare quality to it that i really i really liked how you tapped into it which and this is not a tremendous spoiler but the way you depicted uh demonic powers in it where it's like on some level it's yeah it's cartoony and a little bit some people could kind of see it as you know it's non-threatening because it's cartoony but in a way that i found that that made it so much more sinister and frightening to me cool like yeah it had that had that quality of like you know a, a swarm of flies or something cool yeah um yeah the yeah the i think like cooking analogy is like with the you know, providing, providing escapism, providing something, a gift. It's like, it's like, a, let's say with any type of evangelism, not, not a religious, it could be religious evangelism. It could be um, marketing evangelism. You know, it's like, this is, you know, this is the best movie or this is the, or this is what you need to go to, you know, this is where you should go to school or whatever. Basically wh who's ever truth or whoever's honesty, if they just give you the straight, facts and they don't know how to make it beautiful or they don't have to know how to show it in a beautiful way then it's just like it's just like inviting a lot of people to your table and then you know getting the the bucket of protein the bucket <laughs> of vegetables you know, the bucket of vitamins over here um like you're just you've you provided it every you know People can survive on all of these, you know. The bodybuilders, the bodybuilders in the chat would probably be okay with that, but most people, yeah, not. Yeah, yeah, like you know, it's like you. This is what you need. It's like that's true. You do need all these things, but you know, like who who wants to who wants to eat that? You know, like who wants to enjoy that? Like this is insulting. Like you just insulted everyone. You you've told us that this was a meal, and you've only given us sustenance you know if someone was starving you know if someone was like of course they would do it but in this uh context in, in the context that we live in um people are so uh over you know over sensitized and, and just like uh given so many delicacies or candy almost that anyway it is appropriate to really take your time in the oven <laughs> And, you yeah. know, in the decoration and the plating and everything and pre present it as a gift that someone will not just uh, eat because they're hungry, but eat because they want to eat it. Like they'll, they'll mark their schedule for that restaurant and be like looking forward to that meal. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I totally agree with that gift idea. Um, Got a question from Brian Edward Miller, who's uh, another amazing artist. I've seen his, uh, seen his illustrations on uh, various like, outdooring uh products and stuff um so he was he, he's got a question he's asking how how you landed on the final look of the book because he's been following it along since the early days of when you were working on it and wants to know when did you decide that this is the look yeah thanks for the question brian um yeah we've, we've interacted on instagram for a long time and uh yeah it's always like whenever i see his like icon there i'm like oh he's been he's been with you for a long time um, so I really appreciate that. Um, I think like as the, as the book went through the iterations, like it, it was a refining and edit, a visually editing process of figuring out what the graphic novel is. And there's like two, two ways that this could go like two extremes. Like I think a, a graphic novel could be more like a movie. 
So what that would require, in my opinion, is potentially zero white, zero page, full color everywhere, full color even on it, 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 between the panels, um, or no panels, you know, separating everything with just a line. Um, of course, that that's tricky. But I, I am actually interested in, in that type of comic as well. Um, and so, because you you're you're getting away from the the framework of pages of white space of margin, um, like a movie, and it's more immersive. Um, and so, that's the one extreme. I went the other way, which is making it more like a a text. So the panel the the panels and the layout of the book. Um, did shape like actually what was inside of the panels too um like the compositions of really all of my pictures are very um are very like cut out uh i would say cut out like it's got a four you know four if it has three elements you could have foreground foreground big ground and background um and they're stacked on each other and so if it was a if it was an animation, it would be sort of parallaxing and you could maybe get a little bit of motion there, but there's not a lot of perspective. You know, we're not really ever looking down on a character from above. Um, and that's, that's probably because I can't draw that. <laughs> like uh, uh, maybe later I'll be able to do that kind of um, perspective, but perspective is actually the thing that I don't have a feel for really. Um, and so, the cutout aspect really helped me figure out that the shapes are most important. So the um, really iconography, like here, here's a good sense, like this image on the screen. Um, I'll, I'll go back to that. It works with every image. I, I promise you every image that I've done is usually this way, <laughs> which is like, is it uh, this one right here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's, that's the most recent one. Um, it's just a, an illustration, but it, it holds up too, because it's, it's more iconographic than um, than atmospheric or than perspective. Um, so it's it's really flat. The the things overlap, like you know, the book overlaps his chest, his arm overlaps the the uh, the sheep, the you know the sheep overlap the the hill, um, and so there's a layer there's a layer of depth. But it's almost like a tapestry, almost more like a tapestry than a um, than a, a perspective draw a drawing or a perspective painting. Um, like shadows, like if you look at most, you know, all of the images in the books, I don't really know how to do a cast shadow. <laughs> like totally, like basing my answer on what I can't do. <laughs> but really, that that's sort of how the style came about, which is like, what what am I doing? And how do I make it better? So, you know, it's a, it's a lot of things that I can't do or haven't been, you know, uh, been able to do yet um, that that I've tried to refine of like, you know, shape is important. Um, and what can I do with the outlines uh, as an interesting? Um, and how can I stack? How can I stack uh, those those shapes on each other to make an image? kind of like collage. <laughs> yeah, I, I I do a little bit of the same myself. Like I know how to do cast shadows, but I actually don't I don't you I don't use realistic shading most of the time. And that's something that uh some of the people in the chat who are, you know, maybe a little more struggling or in the beginning or beginner or intermediate stages of things, like to echo what Ben said, yeah, yes, it is important for you to keep learning as much as you can. But also keep in mind that your own limitations can become stylistic identifiers, kind of like how Mike Magnola admits that he hates drawing cars. He he's terrified of them. So what does he do? He makes all his stories take place in, you know, tent lost tombs and graveyards and old villages and stuff in mountainsides and the and the sea and stuff. Yeah. And nobody's going to be distracted by the fact that he can't draw a car because He's making stylistic choices around it. Uh, so I got a question here from Meerkat who asks, what was your favorite part about making your comic, Ben? Uh, 
Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. I really liked I really liked writing dialogue. Like I could like I really liked fitting the pieces of dialogue together um, in a concept way, like having the the arguments uh, or the the discussion between um, characters. Uh, that was a really fun, not effortless, but I wasn't drawing, like I wasn't banging, you know, sometimes I was, I was banging my head against like, how do, how does uh, this, this part in the story match up with this part, but with writing dialogue, like that was really fun. Uh, that's probably my favorite part about writing a book is when I actually start to hear the characters mm. and I start to think, think, you know, if there's more, I know what they're going to say here. Um, and as they, as they speak to each other, you know, we gain, we gain like an atmosphere of what's happening. Um, so the writing, but the drawing, I mean, the, the design work really like designing characters is a real, uh, also a highlight on the visual side. Like, uh, I don't know how to, I mean, I've, I've done like very little, um, uh, actually work for hire um animation design um so but alex toth is actually a big uh, inspiration along with oh Mike yeah and, and like his stuff uh is just so i'm always looking at it and trying to just make that you know as an art form just the cart the the uh character design um and um just on its own on its own merit like character design is such a cool um such a cool uh, thing to do so fun so fun to do yeah I, I know we're coming up on we're up just past the hour now but try to squeeze in a couple more questions if we can uh owen zaleski uh thanks us for doing the stream and says that uh he and his brother are working on their own web comic and he's the owen's the artist and his brother is the writer and he asks is there any advice you have for first time creators first time creators um, I don't have that much experience with web comics, reading or publishing them. Um, I'd ask, you know, if, if it could be contained in a print book, I would, I would say, you know, try to try to print uh, a first issue or, you know, a collection of the first issue and get it out to people, you know, go to, go to shows. Um, I mean, of course, of course, if you're, if your skills are not what you want them to be, keep keep doing web comics at zero cost um if you if you're seeing growth and you're seeing improvement on like style of art and you know improving that and also improvement of writing if if the writing is getting stronger like keep doing keep doing the web comic until you you're like okay this this is what we need to publish and to put out there um, and i say that because like if it's physical people have to do something with it and they have to we can't easily forget it if they bought it or if you, you're selling it to them. Uh, there's just some, you know, some some magic there where uh, people can really pick it up and feel it, see the artwork, see the the love that you made to do it. Um, but as far as just like making a comic, I mean, of course, getting better. Like there's a qualitative, really quality. It's like you can do anything. You can self-publish. You can get a publisher. If you're, if the quality of your work is awesome, <laughs> it's like yeah. kind of dumb and like, I hope it's not trite. Uh, but like that, that's like my best advice. Like, you know, try to make it, try to make it awesome, but realize that's going to take a long time. And so, you know, the investment of your time, uh, is important, but it, it may not look like, you know, if you're busy with other things, it may not look like, um, you know, every day, but if you can, if you can get, you know, three, three or four hours, like, yeah, a, a chunk of time, a chunk of time every day, even if it's an hour uh, to two hours, like two hours a day would, I think would be excellent to practice um, both writing and drawing to get, to get to the quality that you want. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I pretty much would have said the same thing. Yeah. Just, you just have to focus on visual quality and clarity so that the average non-artist can easily understand what you're doing and enjoy it. 
Yeah, that, that's the main thing. It's like it has to it has to read clearly and it has to read appealingly. Mm-hmm. Um, so we got a question from Modern Businessman asking: Is uh, is word of mouth the best way to get your works out? I'm guessing uh, he's asking about like just general, yeah, marketing exposure and stuff like that. Yes, I actually don't know if there's another way to get your work out there, like <laughs> like word of mouth. Uh, it, you know. You could clarify, um, modern business and word of mouth. It's a saying that I think encompasses all communication now. Like, uh, you know, if it's specifically just like talking, talking and sharing with people, uh, yes, do that. Um, but it does, does it, I would say it does include all communication. So communicating about your work, communicating about your own work is the best way to get your work out there. Uh, and you will have to, you will have to do that. You will have to be that person. Even if you have a publisher, um, they, they will not know how to sell it. Like you can sell it. <laughs> like, um, well, they might, if you're a really bad salesman or if you're a really bad communicator, um, it, it does take time to be able to communicate about your work and be uh, an objective kind of champion of your own work. Um, I read, um, a book called made to stick can't remember who the author was, but it's like uh, an orange cover. It has like a uh, duct tape, like stuck on the cover, you know, fake, fake duct tape. Um, but that was a really good book to think about, like how to distill my story into a sentence or two. Um, and like that, that took a long time and I can, I can do it right now. Just for an example, um, you know, Joe death, is i haven't done i haven't been to a comic con in a little while let me me grab my uh uh jonath is about a skeleton uh who has a little uh moth that lives inside his chest they ride around the west burying uh the desert burying the bones of people who have died um so when he's actually asked to save somebody he thinks life is outside of his jurisdiction uh and he kind of denies the call but through the course of the adventure he realizes that he is inside life's jurisdiction um, and life is bigger than him and he actually has a place in life and a role to fulfill and he finds his own life along the way um, so that's that's like my short you know couple sentences that yeah. i say at a at a you know to everyone that i talk to at a convention and like i can tell if it works in their brain uh, and it usually does um but you know that that type of principle of like figuring out, you know, as an artist, you, you just made something. Um, and there was a reason why you made it. Um, what is it now? And how do I share that with someone else in a, in an audible word, you know, words that were written that they will understand having no, <laughs> having no context or no background. Um, you have to explicitly share what it is, uh, in, in a clear way to someone who, uh, might buy it yeah yeah that i i I can't emphasize that kind of brevity and clarity enough because a lot of times people will say you know they'll pitch a story concept or something they're working on and it'll just be like a wall of text of lore and different factions in the world and character histories and stuff and nobody's going to be hooked by that you got to give them something quick and simple kind of like how the movie jaws could be summarized as it's like beowulf but at the beach there you go (laughs) or you know town sheriff who's terrified of the water has to uh fight a giant shark that's terrorizing the beaches there you go um yeah Yeah. we'll probably have to wrap up soon here but because i know you're you you got you probably got to get going to dinner soon but i got a question this is a this is easy promotion so i'd I'm, I'm okay. If people have, uh, have more questions, I'm okay to ask. Okay. Just, just let me know if we're, let me know if we're really like coming up against the, uh, against the wire there. So Nimbus asks, uh, did the idea of Joe death exist before you started, before you decided to make a graphic novel? Um, no, no, no. Uh, I think, um, no, he, he was very much like, there because of the image like because i knew i was going to draw him um and so it was he was never going to be a 
uh, it was never a story that was for, uh, that could be told in a book, like a, a prose novel. It was always like, um, it was always going to be a graphic novel. Yeah. I saw, I saw like Hellboy in Hell, like when actually the last issue came out and I like, I was like, oh, he's actually ending this thing. Uh, and I had read like the chain coffin or something before and really liked Mike's work, you know, but, but I really wasn't that interested in picking up the larger story of Hellboy until like Hellboy in Hell. And um, I saw like the last issue and I was like, whoa, this is, this is incredible. And so at that moment I was like, okay, I, I've got to, I've got to do a comic. And so I, I started to figure out, yeah, started thinking about the story, the story as a comic um, or, or, or a, a comic. And then what is the story? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I'm, I, I could definitely rel relate to that well, to some degree. I mean, Wyatt probably existed even with, well, even before I knew if I was good, had it in me to do a graphic novel for. So it's, yeah, there's not really any right or wrong answer there. You know, you can always take your personal OCs and find a way to story them up, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's about it for the questions that we got. And, uh, you know, we've been going for about an hour and 10 minutes here. And I, you know, I want to remind people again to, uh, hit the link in the, uh, video info, uh, just below, uh, to the Amazon storefront where you can get this, like get it now. Cause it's pro. I don't know. I, I think you mentioned earlier that it have maybe has sold out in a few places. So, I think uh, I, I'm just going to artificially create some FOMO here and tell people to get it now because it will sell out in about uh, 12 minutes. So get it now or you'll be extremely sad and you'll be paying like $300 for used copies on eBay within the end of the week. Absolutely do it. Yeah. And I mean, and if you want it signed and can't get to a show that I'm at, uh, you can buy it uh, signed. I draw in every comic from my website. Um, oh, so nice! Copies there, yeah. Uh, actually, that's that's another quick opportunity. Are there any upcoming uh, book signings or convention type events you you've got scheduled? In case anybody might be in in your area. Yeah, um, I'll be at a small SPX Small Press Expo September 9th through tenth at um, in Maryland, uh, and then I'll be at uh cartoon crossroads columbus cxc september 27th through october 1st columbus ohio um and then i'll be at lightbox expo actually uh which is a an animation kind of expo in uh, pasadena california that's october 27th through 29th uh, are you close to pasadena reagan or somewhat i'm in northern san diego county so pasadena depending on traffic is about two two and a half hours from me so I don't know if I'm going to light box this year, but at the very least, uh, I might be able to get up there and, uh, meet up possibly. Cool. Yeah. 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 I love going to, love going to shows. Yeah. Awesome. But yeah. It, and also, uh, I've linked to your social medias, uh, links in the, in the uh, video info here. So everybody should go check those out. If you want to stay on top of, uh, Ben's appearances and projects and stuff. Um, I think that's uh, about it. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to ask quickly: How's uh, Wyatt gone? What it was? It's going. It's going pretty good. I'm I'm working on the uh, new website uh, for it because uh, I don't have a lot. Of, uh, Squarespace has been uh, pricing me out, and so oh. I, I need to build. I'm building a new website on in WordPress right now, and also just like raw HTML and CSS. Yeah. And so I'll have a new website with uh, character bios, lore, world map, and other cool stuff uh, for the book. Uh, and aside from that, I've been, you know, working on lettering the comic, trying to not, trying to not perfectionism spiral on the dialogue. Uh, but then once that's wrapped up, I'm going to be resuming the art on the final chapter, and I'm hoping to finish it up uh, this fall. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sweet. I I've never talked to, uh, to you about this, but uh, I I had a mission. Like, was SWAT cats a big influence or like? Uh, it wasn't a gigantic influence, but I I watched a few episodes as a kid, and it did leave an impression on me for sure. Yeah, like yeah. SWAT cats, Star Fox, Secret of Nim, uh, Red Wall, uh, yeah. stuff like that. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. It's very cool. I can't I can't wait to 
get a hold of a copy of it when it comes. Oh, thanks. Yeah, good luck. Awesome. I oh, much appreciate it. <laughs> and, you know, and seeing how long it took you to do Joe Death gives me a little bit of encouragement considering like the just life related delays that I've hit, you know, with working and living on a farm and all the uh, scheduling problems that that poses for an artist. So, yeah. Yeah. You, so, yeah. You, you do want to get to the finish line in, in the, in, uh, in the right way. It's like, you can, you know, in insert who, whatever kind of terrible uh, Hollywood, right. You know, rise to the top, you know, over dead bodies or something or, or corporate <laughs> yeah. lives. You, you can get to somewhere that you really want to get to in the wrong ways. And then you, and then you, uh, yeah. And then you, uh, you have no idea why you even wanted to be there because everyone you, you loved or, or loved you is destroyed because you had no time for them. So. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, right that, this has been an excellent conversation. Lots of extremely good advice. I think uh, people will get a lot of, a lot of use out of, I uh, want to, give you a huge thanks for your time. And uh, we really look forward to Joe death too. Yeah. Thanks for I, force, I foresee thanks. it happening. It's got to happen. It has to. Yeah. It'll come. It'll come. All Appreciate right, man. It. I'll see you around later. Thanks everybody. Thanks everybody for tuning in.